Hey everybody, Fiori here. Uh, I thought I would uh, offer this video uh, as a way to get into uh, one of my favorite books, The Advancement of Learning uh, by Francis Bacon, who's, uh, I guess you call him a philosopher who lived at the time of Shakespeare. He was a member of uh, Queen Elizabeth's administration. He was the Lord Chancellor of England. And um, he had an idea that knowledge should be gathered and categorized so that something called science could begin. And for that reason, he is the father of modern science, as some people say. And this is in dispute. Everything's in dispute. The word science, the word father, the word everything is in dispute. But let's, let's, let's get into uh, the book itself and talk about some issues, because I like to talk about issues rather than getting into polemics and controversies. Uh, but there'll be time for talking about historical controversies, which are important too. Uh, here, I wanna start with a question for all of you. Um, why is science called science? I mean, it, the word is, uh, if we look at the etymology of the word, the root of the word, it's a Latin word, and it means knowledge. It does not mean what it means today which more or less, I guess, we can define as uh, um, the technological know-how to control nature uh, for the benefit of human beings. So, um, I mean, that's, if you have a better definition, I just kind of thought of that, but uh, I, think, I think that's it. Uh, so, so, um, so the father of modern science didn't invent anything. Uh, some people say he invented the scientific method, which is the idea that, um, we should make experiments and see the results of those experiments and gather the um, gather gather uh, the data and then come to a conclusion from those experiments. Uh, but you know he goes deeper than that. He goes deeper than kind of a. I mean he did do that, but he goes deeper. He goes into like a kind of a conversation about what why it's even good to want to have knowledge to gather knowledge and because. When you talk about science, and you know, not long after Francis Bacon, you have uh, later in the 17th century, you have um, Galileo, you have Newton, and you have people who actually um, did uh, make you know monumental discoveries. Of not too long after the circulation of the blood, and in the 18th century, the things like oxygen being discovered and all kinds of things. Um, but but the idea here is that. He's actually going deep into how we filter out uh, information so we know which information to pay attention to and which information kind of gets in the way of our observations, of our thinking, of our conclusion. So it's really a kind of an education in thinking itself. And that's why the book is so great, because the book can be read as, you know, the book of uh, you know, by the father of modern science, but it can also be read as a kind of almost like, um, you know, kind of a self-help book in a way, or a kind of inspirational book about how you clean out uh, your mind of certain thoughts. And even the way he does it, the way he makes up his argument is quite, quite beautiful. And it's an example of um, a certain type of rhetoric, right? And the old meaning of rhetoric that like to persuade. Uh, and, and it's, Let's take a look, and I'll, I'll talk more about how he does that. So here we are at the beginning, and this is my edition that I love. This is called the Everyman series, which came out in the early 20th century, 1920, 1930. Beautiful font. Um, you know, I'll go look for the actual originals. Uh, there's, you can find in these great databases, you know, what the original printing looked like, you know, 16, whatever. But uh, this is pretty beautiful, too. And um, here we have the end of the dedication. You see there's a number three up there. And then you have a section one, number one. Uh, and what he's doing is quite beautiful and elegant. And what he's doing is um, he's laying out a list of objections uh, that people have against why, against the gathering of knowledge, right? And then what he's doing is he's trying more or less to be objective. And he says, you know, look, here's one objection, here's another objection. And here are my reactions to those objections. Now, this is interesting, just the way he does that, because it's scientific, right? But um, if you looked at him as one of these, you know, crashing on the scene geniuses, 
we like you know demolish what came before you would miss that this method of of logic you know uh you know objection and then refutation of the objection you know uh laying it out with numbers and sections this is very medieval uh this is and and later we'll talk a little bit about one of the great theories by a professor i used to have uh back in edinburgh in scotland you know of where he even got the idea of categorizing that one just way and the answer to that question is quite beautiful uh but so before we get into this thing you know this very modern thing of like you know this guy came came on the scene and, and was a revolutionary even that word is kind of a bizarre word um which uh, whose etymology is actually beautiful in itself we'll, we'll get into that uh in another video but uh the point there is he's using medieval logic to establish a new way of talking about something you know it's quite all right guys so um so he's using medieval and but, but he's not laying it out exactly the way the medievals would have done uh like a thomas aquinas let's say uh they would have actually laid that out in sections like thesis and antithesis and they have all these beautiful words for the kinds of you know things like that he's just having simple numbers and here's number one number two is going to be an objection you can predict the first objection uh you can predict what kind of objection it would be it has tons of them but you can imagine what the first one could be right um and then number three will be the answer to that objection so it's, it's really the numbers are not quite laid out as elegantly as it would be in the middle ages uh but basically so number one is an introduction number two is going to be uh the first objection uh to the gathering of knowledge and then number three is going to be the the response to that objection right his his refutation of it. let's get into it and uh, oh wow i just love these old texts and these words in the entrance of the former of these to clear the way so this is he's referring to something from before which i'll actually skip feeling a little guilty but i'll skip it and as it were to make silence there's the first beautiful part right so some people say he was shakespeare you know like his language is wow to make silence. I don't know if that's a big deal. It's a big deal to me. To have the two testimonies concerning the dignity of learning to be better heard. There we go. Without the interruption of passive objections. He wants to make silence while he's telling you this. So that the true testimony about why learning is so good can be heard. He wants you to be quiet while he's while he's writing this. <laughs> What, what, obviously you're quiet, you're reading it. No, because people have tacit objections. You see that little part there? In other words, while I'm reading, I'm having some doubts about what I'm reading. So he says, you know, before I tell you all the great things about knowledge, which is much later in the book, let me kind of go through all the doubts you may have so that I can create silence. And then you'll really be receptive to what I'm saying. So not only is does he have a methodology and a system for explaining science, but he's also going to explain why he's explaining and how he's explain. Oh my gosh, beautiful. Okay, here we go. So here's the first objection. You can imagine what it what it is. I hear the former sort say, this is one of the people that objects to him, that knowledge is of those things which are to be accepted of with great limitation and caution. Knowledge is dangerous. Now, Bacon, as you know, if you study a little Bacon, uh, was the guy who said knowledge is power. But some people say, no, knowledge is dangerous. Why? That the aspiring to overmuch knowledge was the original temptation and sin whereupon ensued the fall of man. So you can imagine in, the, in, a, in, a, in a time of religious controversy, I won't say in a time of religion, but in a time of religious controversy, um the religious objection is going to be the first thing on his mind and everybody's mind why should i go for knowledge isn't that the way that we got messed up to begin with adam ate the apple and uh and that's how original sin entered the world right i'm not even going to talk about eve um because this is the history of patriarchy right so so then he continues and he's trying to be objective and showing showing this 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 um objection um in its full force, right? He doesn't want to do a straw man thing. So he goes, um, that knowledge hath in it somewhat of the serpent, and therefore where it entereth into a man, it maketh, it makes him swell. I mean, I'm adding the Elizabethan English without even 
being forced to. Uh, so a little sexual overtone there, which is not unusual for the Elizabethan poetry, Elizabethan prose. When the serpent enters you, you swell. Okay. Um, uh, but by swell, there's another meaning there, which is you get a swollen head. In other words, you get um, uh, an exaggerated um, opinion of yourself. You know more, uh, you think you're better than other people. And in fact, he goes to the Latin and he says, scientia inflat. You guys can correct my Latin. I don't know if it's scientia, scientia, scientia. Uh, but basically, it means knowledge swells you, swells a person right? In flat, to swell. And here you see the word science being used, not the way we use it today, but the way they used it then, which is knowledge, basically just knowledge. So knowledge makes one proud. And then Solomon gives a censure. In other words, the King Solomon in the Bible um, criticizes knowledge and says that there is no end of making books and that much reading is a weariness of the flesh. And this is from... Um, you know, one of the most unusual parts of the Bible, which is Ecclesiastes. That's a great quote, made me think twice growing up, you know, I love books, and I was like, wow, in the Bible it says that too many books are bad, knowledge is bad, really, and um, so then he goes on, and he quotes from the Bible again, he says, that is, in spacious knowledge there is much contrastation, and that he that increaseth knowledge increaseth anxiety. And then he quotes St. Paul. So he's got a little Old Testament action, a little New Testament action going on, that we not be spoiled through vain philosophy. So, so, so he's, he's pretty fair here in presenting the full uh, original objection to knowledge that isn't that what messed us up to begin with as, as uh, human beings. And God doesn't want us to gather knowledge, obviously. He takes it pretty seriously. Here's his objection. Can you guess what it is? You might want to pause the video and guess. Does he object to it by saying religion is silly? Does he object by saying um, it's okay to say that, but science is a separate activity? Uh, what does he say? To discover then the ignorance and error of this opinion and the misunderstanding in the grounds thereof, it may well appear these men do not observe or consider that it was not the pure knowledge of nature and universality a knowledge by the light whereof man did give names unto other creatures in paradise, as they were brought before him according unto their proprieties. Da, 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 da. But it was the proud knowledge of good and evil with an intended man to give law unto himself. Now this is a spoken like a true monarchist, right? Uh, so he's like, he has this huge long sentence that's full of all kinds of layers and extra stuff laid on, right? So let's break it down. Um, God didn't prohibit us from learning about nature, plants and animals. Otherwise, why would he have given Eve the, uh, the power of naming animals and Adam to categorize all living things? He already gave him that power. And he was already, Adam and Eve were already busily naming things, right? The very first thing they did was name things, right? So actually quite beautiful. Um, that's not the kind of knowledge that God wanted to prohibit, because they already had that knowledge uh, while they were still immortal, before the aid of the tree. No, it was the proud knowledge of good and evil with an intended man to give law unto himself. That's the kind of knowledge God didn't want us to have. So that's spoken like a true monarchist in two ways, two layers. Uh, God as the king is the one who gives laws. The Bible is the law. And why should we question that? And Queen Elizabeth is the queen, and she gives the law, although the reign of Queen Elizabeth is actually one of the, uh, the foundations of modern uh, law in many ways, where law is established as a separate, a separate uh, kind of uh, foundation for uh, adjudication of cases, rather than you know, dictate or judgment, pure judgment. So, 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 um, He's, he's sidestepping. He's saying, look, God does want us to have knowledge because otherwise he wouldn't have given Adam that power to name names. And that's what science is, isn't it? It's naming names. It's identifying things and making distinctions, right? Because look at how he talks about the way names are given. 
as they were brought before him according unto their proprieties. Right? So today the word propriety has a different meaning. But uh, by this sentence, I'm guessing, I mean, that's how I try to learn <laughs> the meaning of words. You know, I'm, I am a second language learner. My Italian is my first language. And uh, as a little kid, I, I spoke dialect and, and I learned English when I was little. And that's how I learned it. I looked at the sense. Gosh, what is that word propriety? Holy moly. I mean, I didn't learn this one. But, uh, it must mean properties, right? So the properties of animals are being learned as Adam names them. He looks at them. He studies them. He tries to understand what their properties are, what the behavior is. And then he gives them a name, right? Um, and so that's okay. <laughs> and so ejection number one is taken care of. Isn't that amazing? I just love this kind of stuff. I hope you did too. And thank you so much for listening. And we will go on to a couple more little tasty tidbits from the advancement of learning. Uh, and then later on, we will get into the philosophy of knowledge uh, with Bacon. But not getting too intense on it. Um, we're not going to do it super analytically, but just in this, in this kind of chatty way that I'm doing it. And hopefully uh, you'll comment. And uh, maybe somebody will be willing to talk with me about some of these ideas and we can go back and forth and have a great time uh, exploring the history of ideas. Take care, guys.